Hello, everybody, and welcome. I am your moderator, Femi OK. It's so good to see you. This webinar will be memorable for three reasons. One, we are connecting climate change, conflict, and security together. Two, it is 45 minutes long. I know, a 45 minute webinar, that is pretty impressive because we respect your time. And number three, we have the pleasure of having, by way of our opening remarks, the brand new executive director of International Alert, Nick Haley. Nick, how new? How new are you? Nice to see you. First, first day today for me. Congratulations. How should we start this incredibly important webinar? Well, thank you to you for hosting us. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to everyone for coming along. I just want to say, I'm really excited to be here because it's, as you say, it's my first day. I just want to introduce International Alert to those who may not know us. Uh, we were founded 30 years ago to tackle the root causes of conflict. And we're working in over 20 countries around the world on, on all sorts of issues from peaceful economies to gender to violent extremism. But, but climate change is obviously the existential threat that we face as a species, as a planet. And climate change runs through absolutely everything that we do, whether that's in communities, in places like Mali, where we're working on, on issues of water and land and grazing, which cause conflict, whether that's in terms of global research or, or international engagement, where we're trying to be part of this hugely important conversation that you're hosting today. So uh, that's all I really want to say about the organization. I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank the Swedish government, CEDA, for supporting us. And I hope we have a really great discussion. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick, and congratulations on your new job. So viewers, I see you. Thank you so much for joining us. The chat is open. You can have a bilateral conversation as the panelists are having their conversation as well. If I see something good, I may well incorporate it into our panel discussion. Let's meet the panel. Hello, Jessica. Hello, Jason. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Ikal. So nice to see you. I'm going to get you all to do your introduction by way of how important what you do is to today's conversation. Jessica, you start. Thank you, Femi. Um, well, my name is Jessica Hartog. Um, I work with International Alerts, where I am uh, responsible for managing uh, our work on um, natural resource management, climate change, and the connection with, with conflict and, and peace building. And I'm really excited for, for today's uh, conversation. Good to have you. Hello, Jason. Tell everybody who you are, what you do, why you're important to this conversation. Great. I'm so happy to be part of this. I'm Jason Mitchell, co-head of Responsible Investment at Man Group. Man is in, uh, in, uh, uh, an asset manager. I think this is important because uh, you know, I, I principally focus on a number of specific areas, climate change being one, biodiversity loss being another, but conflict is just inextricably linked to, to climate. And so from a sustainable finance perspective, it's something that you know, we're compelled to, to, to factor in. I'm looking forward to making those connections. Ikal, welcome. Introduce yourself to our webinar audience. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ikal Angile. I work with Friends of Turkana, based in northwestern Kenya. Um, this conversation is important because we live in a place where constant conflict over you know, the struggle for water resources, pasture, um, is, is, is really what we, leave, we, 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 we experience every time. And, and the discussion about climate change is really important for us because we started to experience it way before it became a, a niche topic in the globe. Mm -hmm. And finally, Jonathan, welcome. Jonathan, tell everybody who you are, what you do, why you're important to this conversation. Hey everyone, I'm Jonathan Stone. I'm the Deputy Head of the Climate Adaptation Department in the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, and I also take a lead across the organisation in, in climate security. Um, why am I important? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd like to think that if I do my job well, then I'm not very important to this conversation because, you know, mm -hmm. our sort of role centrally um, in government, especially with policy, is to make sure that things work so that you don't really um, see us or notice us apart from get support and see sensible um, policies. Um, so yes, I'd like to think not important, um, but let's see. All right. So, so Jessica, we, we make an assumption here as we start our conversation, climate change, conflict, security, they are connected. You truly believe that, you see that. Tell us more. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Indeed, whether climate change will cause conflict is, is, is not really a question. It is really already happening. 
And and reason is that um, climate change is, as we already said, is affecting everything in our daily lives. It affects where and how we live, how we grow our food, um, and where and how we uh, access water. And as a result, we, we basically see new rivalries emerging as people struggle to access rent and water. Uh, we see old conflicts flare, and, and we also see people suffering uh, greater injustices in, in places that are hardest hit by, by climate change. Um, but I really want to point out, though, that the relationship between climate change and conflict is, is not a simple direct causal relationship. And I don't want to go into the details of that um, because it will take us down a long conversation. Mm. What I want to make sure, make clear here is that it, it, that climate change is an important contributing factor to, to conflict in places that already see instability and that see poor, poor governance. Um, and there are many examples, um, but let me take you to, uh, for instance, the Sahel, um, which is seeing uh, societal disruption due to climate change um, across the region. Um, it's actually a region that is uh, going to see a dramatic uh, three degree uh, temperature increase by, by 2050. In comparison, the IPCC is predicting 1.5 for uh, the rest of the world on average. Um, at the same time, the same the region the same region is going to see uh, a doubling of its population in, in most countries. Now, those two facts are already uh, ingredients for for something dramatic happening. Whereas, if you look at today, um, the region already has uh, sees around 80% of its farmland being affected by soil erosion and and deforestation. So, yeah, it shouldn't really be a surprise that uh, conflicts are already happening um, and that people are are dying every day. Um, due to competition over, over, over land and water resources. And we will see that in, in, in the years and, and decades to come, livelihoods will be put under even greater stress um, due to issues like overfarming, poor land management and soil erosion. And for the Sahel, um, th this means that the governments are, are just facing an absolutely daunting task to mediate uh, uh, conflict, uh, to distribute resources more uh, equitably, uh, to guarantee food security, and to manage increased climate-related uh, migration. Um, and yeah, reality is though that governance is generally weak across the region, um, which is which is a real worry um, as to what the future holds for, for the region. Iko, take us to Kenya and give us examples of how climate change and conflict are coming together. There's a confluence there for sure. Yeah, so just building on what um, Jessica was saying, uh, one of the things that you can see is that um, just because of the competition for resources, the way of production means that some, you know, there's a fight between access and exclusion to access certain resources, to access lands for production, then some people are excluded. And this, we can see it even here. I'm a, I'm a pastoralist. I come from a pastoralist community. And the before we were, we had collective use of lands in territories, but now with one expansion, as, as Jessica said, it's not very direct, but because of urbanization, because of oil extraction, you can see a push for more production to meet certain needs. But in the, it, with that, it means that pastoralists have less access to pasture, to water. You see in areas like Lykepia, we know one part to get a pastoralist community, which there is a lot of conservation going on there. At the moment, pastoralists don't have access to water and pasture and find themselves needing to access this within the conservation areas. And this is creating a lot of conflict. So right now, the Kenyan government has sent uh, huge security forces to in, you know, exclude the access of pastoralists to areas that they need for their own uh, for livestock to to survive at that expense then creating more conflict so you can see this cut across various areas there's a huge push for uh, uh, um, infrastructure and extraction within the continent and all this means that certain people who are using those lands for their production and reproduction are now excluded from those spaces for this, you know, this new developments to happen. Because again, there's this whole push that Africa is, you know, developing. It's a new frontier of extraction and resources. And it's very critical for us to look at what does this extraction of resources means and how does this exacerbate uh, uh, climate, climate impacts. And at a time when the narrative is we in the continent have not increased and not really contributors to the climate crisis. And so, you know, a push for, for more extraction to happen in the continent. So I see that in Kenya and I see it across the continent. Mm. Ika, I have a question that I want to put to you. I'm, I'm going to go around all of the panelists first before I start fighting questions at you. But I see your questions and I see your greetings from all over the world. Thank you, viewers. All right, Jonathan, will you remind us what your official job title is? 
That's a good question. Um, so I'm the, I'm the deputy head of the climate adaptation department, um, but I also work on, on climate security within FCDO, um, of, of which we're combining a lot together at the moment because of COP coming up. Uh, the climate you know conference of parties unf triple c um, event in glasgow this year um, and then i have a this, this side focus on on climate security all right side focus that kind of like ooh, 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 that's a that's a little buzzer there for me side focus i am wondering is this a side focus for the uk government how aware are they of the connection between climate change and conflict is that factoring in to how they are approaching climate policy. Yeah, I mean, the UK is critically aware of it. Um, and to clarify the side focus, um, I suppose, you know, everything for us at the moment is, is about COP and, and rightly so. Um, you know, we see all of these challenges that are happening at the moment, as Ikal and others have mentioned around the world. And that's, you know, that's with 1.1 degrees warming and COP is really trying to limit it to 1.5. And, you know, as, um, as we heard at the beginning, that's that's average. Um, some areas are going to be much worse. So we, uh, I guess, in the UK, see you know climate change as an existential threat to humanity, as as do many others. I suppose you know nothing other than an all-out kind of world nuclear conflict um, is going to have this, a similar kind of scale of impact over the next. 50 to 100 years on, on the ways in which we live and particularly on the most vulnerable. So it really is uh, amongst everything we do. Um, and, and at the moment, the sort of, you know, the sharp point of that focus is really on COP and it's delivering on this, you know, net zero commitments. It's really about um, thinking about adaptation, you know, how are we going to adjust to these, these problems that we see? Um, how are there going to be finance available for people to do what they know we need to do and you know how to how do we work together so yes um you know climate security hugely important to the uk and i think one of the opportunities that cop has given us is that because climate is the big thing across government many of your kind of normal security actors who were maybe climate passionate individuals have now found themselves in climate passionate departments and organizations as well so it's, it's been exciting to see um to see lots of stuff kind of realign in this direction. Jonathan, uh, excuse me, Jace, Jason, as you listen to this, where's the investment perspective here? Yeah, I would say it's uh, it's it's a certainly concerning. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I sort of I look at it in two ways. I mean, sort of I I I sort of see this as sort of a, a potential replay, this kind of climate conflict problem. Um, uh, particularly in terms of migration, um, following sort of my experience um, when I was in the markets, but I also worked as a journalist writing for the London Review of Books and Christian Science Monitor during the migrant crisis around 2015, 2016, and 2017. And over that period, I spent, I, I followed the, the, the migrant crisis from Calais, France, to, to Lesbos, Greece, to Turkey, ultimately off the coast of, of Libya in, in a a very small um, search and rescue boat, German rescue boat. And I guess one of my sort of takeaway, takeaways was sort of wondering to what degree did the voluntary migration, particularly from Central and Western Africa, which made up a lot of it, it, it um, what, what did it say about sort of the diminishing economic opportunity in those areas? And to what degree would um, uh, uh, sort of climate change and sort of certainly kind of de-risking away from fossil fuels, particularly in Nigeria, where, you know, the oil and gas industry is, is sort of paramount and a, and a huge economic driver accelerate that. Um, and so, you know, in one way, it's, 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 it's something that isn't, um, it, it, it isn't just a discrete problem for emerging markets. It's also a problem for developing markets because, as you recall, you know the, these uh, uh, voluntary migration sort of flowed through up to northern Africa. You know, trapped in areas, they technically became refugees. You know, with lives at risk, and then obviously went on to 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 Europe. And I think one of the things that sort of drove was was political volatility, obviously a swerve to the right in certain markets. It took more than 1 million uh, um, refugees I in Germany for that to happen. It took one to 200,000 in Italy for that move rightward to happen. And, and markets don't like political volatility. So, so I think that, that, that is something that, that, that is worrisome. I think the other issue is, you know, this question of how do we address this um, uh, post 
the pandemic crisis. And I say that because, you know, we're even starting to see this problem take shape in terms of climate investment versus the fatigue around government fiscal support during the crisis. And so how, do, how does climate investment coexist with uh, fiscal austerity? Uh, and, and so that's a worry. And as you recall, you know, several years ago, there was discussions around, you know, the potential uh, uh, debt forgiveness, much like 2005 in, in emerging markets, where, you know, even currently you have debt to GDP ratios of 70% plus some countries even in technical default. And, and, and frankly, post pandemic, I don't think that's, I, I just, I don't think that the appetite is there. Um, and so it, 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 it um, it's worrisome. Okay. Oh, Jess, you go first, and I'm going to ask Ikel. Ikel wrote something down, and I want her to share uh, her notes. Uh, Jessica, you go first. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, to pick up um, the, what Jonathan was talking about, and um, of course, Jonathan um, was really uh, underlining the uh, the UK efforts to uh, make great success of the uh, climate conference happening in Glasgow this year. And really, momentum has been building for, for, for that to happen, because last year it didn't happen because of the pandemic. And I really want to see ambition and consensus and commitments during, during this year's uh, uh, climate conference. However, I think we really want to see as well uh, some recognition that uh, conflict risks are really looming in, in the how of these pledges that are going to make going to be made here at the, uh, at, the, at, the, at the climate conference. So how will we be limiting global warming and how will we be supporting communities to, to adapt to climate change? <clears throat> The changes that are needed to move to, to net zero and to build climate resilience are immense. Um, They're changing the way we go about our economies and how we're going to use our, our resources. And as we should already explain, I mean, there are, there are real conflict risks there. And there are issues emerging around uh, renewable energy and, and, and green minerals. So um, when we're looking at, at renewable energy, which is being massively pushed, and we need to, um, but there is another side of that story because solar, wind, hydro, geothermal energy, um, they require land and water to make it happen. And as Eco already explained, this, this, comes at the, this can come at the expense of, of local communities that rely on these resources for their living, uh, which can then fuel conflict. And then on the other hand, we have the, the challenge around the increasing demand for, for so-called green minerals. Um, wind turbine, turbines, uh, solar panels, energy, energy storage systems, they all require significant mineral and, and metal inputs. And, and they have to come from the, the mining sector um, and they need to be often sourced in, in, in already conflict affected countries. Um, and I'm sure everybody is aware about, for instance, cobalt uh, is probably best known. And, and six, more than 60% of the, of the cobalt resources uh, in the world are located in DRC. Um, and we, we know it's a country that is struggling with, with political instability and, and, and cobalt mines already become, have become hotspots for uh, exploitation by armed groups, um, human rights violation, environmental destruction, uh, corruption, child labor. I mean, the, the, the list is endless. And this really shows that there are real risks of, of reinforcing uh, re-governance and also exacerbating local grievances when, when going about uh, the business of, of extracting green minerals and, and of course, the, the push for renewable energy. And, and yeah, I would be really curious to, to, to see um, how th these issues will be picked up during the COP and afterwards, when actually the real work will start, um, mm. um, when these pledges have to be turned into action. Jonathan, that's your cue. Yeah, well, I mean, I, th I think you've, you've um, very accurately kind of um, spoken of the challenges and and I think you know the world coming together on this uh, with open eyes um, is critically important you know one of the interesting things about COP and climate change is that you know it it pitches us all together as humanity to um, make some tricky decisions and trade-offs between each other um, sovereign states to sovereign state and then you know interested and in, in other um, kind of non-governmental organizations and everyone else have to come together for consensus um, but you know you have an awful lot of nations and representatives there who in other areas are in direct competition and um, you know I think the world is going to change dramatically as a result of climate change uh, we are going to see more conflict and you're quite right saying you know 
the competition for um, mineral resources as part of the green transition, what it might look like when we when we move away from using fossil fuels to other sources of energy. What what does that mean for big um, kind of petroleum producing nations and, and their citizens and their opportunities and life things? And so I think you know it's it's critically important that not only we're trying to mitigate the impact of of, of climate change, but but really thinking about how we adapt to these impacts. And and I think the most important thing for that the, the adaptation is really to keep a focus on the most vulnerable you know who are the most vulnerable groups um to this how are we supporting them and at what scales and, and i think you know everything from the very local community scale all the way up to governance and institutions and strength strengthening the multilateral system is there and, and i hate to sort of point towards the solution being everyone together but you know with such a global existential problem um it really will require this you know everyone um input um with with lots of the ideas and solutions still to be worked out and still to come but you know we are armed with with the knowledge with the ability with this globally connected world where we can you know for the first time meaningfully listen to people from you know really cut off communities all the way through to government have them in the same room at the same time really exchange knowledge and ideas um, there's an awful lot of potential um, it's just a shame that the stakes are quite so high and that the time is is so short um, and that really is the uh, the opportunity of, for all of us of our lifetime is to get this right um, because you know the consequences of you know if the consequences of not getting it right are, are disastrous um, and disastrous for the most poor and the most vulnerable. And that, and that really is the critical issue here. I just wanted to jump in on that one, Femi. Um, I agree with what Jonathan is saying, but I think one of the things we cannot downplay is the reality of uh, the economic trade-offs. You know, we might say we are, we, you know, as much as, you know, everybody believes in the COP, uh, the, you know, possibilities around the COP, but we cannot downplay the power, the skewed power relations between the global North and the global South that by the time we get to the table, we already, you know, just whether it's aid or trade, and, and it, it is something that we've got to be able to, to discuss in plenty. And when Jessica was talking about, it's not only look at the, the recent uh, coup in Guinea, Guinea is also one of the other countries that has, you know, all these rare minerals that are needed for it. So even in this just transition, and no offense, but people like Shell, companies like Shell are now the new renewable companies. So if we don't speak to the economic aspects of this crisis, it then becomes, we will talk about adaptation and mitigation, but unless we talk about the production and where the resources for production are coming from, we keep downplaying those realities. And so we keep looking for mitigation. We keep, so we're no longer addressing the root causes of this crisis. And some of the root causes will mean that we start to analyze that political economy and the economic relations around it that a lot of what the global north brings into the global south is really much less than what the global north takes from the global south and because of that production and that extraction mechanism the the climate crisis is felt is co continues to be felt by the users and you know people who you know the land and the and the forests that that are necessary for production so it goes to really that very skewed uh, power relation that we need to start to look at Jason? Yeah, I was going to say, it, it's sort of interesting because it, it's sort of, uh, I think the, the, the investment community or much of it is, is very polarized. Um, and, and this is, this keeps increasing in terms of how to treat you know, big oil, oil, you know, international uh, uh, integrated oil companies, whether Shale, Exxon, et cetera. And, and sort of, you know, there, there's this, uh, and, and that is being reinforced, particularly through regulation, you know, in, in Europe, legislation, in you know, th that is, explicitly designed to steer capital towards sustainable sectors and away from unsustainable sectors. I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, investors are sort of increasingly sort of making a choice to say, I'm going to um, divest from oil and, and, and go sustainable. Um, you know, there's clearly a subset that are kind of engaging, but I, I do worry that uh, ICAL's uh, sort of statement becomes increasingly amplified, at least in the short term, as you know, uh, um, the investors that really care about this move away from that, which means that, you know, sort of uh, uh, 
the you know resources companies you know it's it's one less pressure point for for the uh for for oil companies in particular jessica help us understand how climate change and conflict when they interact together may well stop us getting to net zero um sorry i didn't get that question what did you say yeah how, how does when, when climate change and conflict interact, when there are security and conflict issues that have come about through climate change, how does that stop climate action from happening? How does that stop future climate policies? Well, basically, um, if, 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 you're, if you're wanting to do climate mitigation and climate adaptation action in, in countries that are already affected by, by conflict or that see uh, weak governance, uh, that see great inequalities, um, you, you might make small kind of gains, small wins with, with climate adaptation, adaptation or mitigation actions, um, but those those actions are going, not going to be sustainable. Um, reality will catch up on us, and um, we will see those those efforts being being uh, ending up in, in vain. Uh, basically, if, um, if if those conflicts are being exacerbated, exacerbated, and especially if we um, see those climate mitigation and climate climate adaptation actions not being happening in, in a conflict sensitive way. So basically um, they don't follow practices of, of do no harm. And we end up in a situation whereby, um, yeah, we, we, we take land away from, from uh, local communities without having a proper consultation with them, uh, potentially maybe uh, kind of misleading them even in some cases um, whereby they sign contracts and then they find out that they have signed off on their, on their land rights, on their livelihoods, on, on basically their, their means of living. And uh, that that there is the real issue, um, and and unfortunately um, there there is a real risk uh, with this massive uh, kind of search for the en green energy transition. Oh, I'm wondering, Jason, if there's a whole different kind of conflict that is happening in the fossil fuel industry, which is there is huge pressure if we are going to avoid. Now we're already in code red for humanity according to the last IPCC assessments are already there. Our red flags are very obvious in every single continent around the world. The fastest way to get to mitigation is to stop using fossil fuels. That could destabilize so many regions around the world. Can you procrast uh, procrastinate, <laughs> Procrast procrastinate for us a little bit, forecast for us a little bit, what that might look like? Is that why we're so far behind in terms of climate action? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting point. I, I think that it's not, it sounds, there's such an emphasis on climate action, um, but not in the context of what the kind of the second order impacts are to sort of people, and that be, might be labor under the just transition or, or conflict areas. And so, you know, I agree with you. I think the, the, the to rush pell-mell into this and not manage you know, particularly in fragile states, you know, those impacts um, creates a lot of uh, an incredible amount of potential volatility. You know, one thing also I'd say is that you know, markets too, and I think you can fault markets for this, but there is an immense amount of pressure now, you know, increasingly sort of legislative and regulative and, and regulatory to focus on climate and through something called TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure, as well as the, now the TNFD, the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosure. And these are uh, these are frameworks that investors are using. You find other frameworks, regulatory frameworks, and you know. It is unfortunate, but these frameworks tend to overlook, ignore conflict and focus mainly on things like human capital, um, employees, board diversity, I mean, gender, you know, kind of parity or, or, or inequity, um, really important things in and of themselves. But, um, but, but because of that, they tend to yeah, sacrifice bigger issues. Um, uh, I mean, you know, that's not to say that there are, I mean, th there is probably a little bit of attention from a sovereign perspective, you know, in the sovereign markets paid to conflict, but, but I would say it's, 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 it's very marginalized. Mm. Um, I, I want this conversation to be practical and pragmatic. Jessica, you go first. What did you want? What, what do you have in your mind? Yeah, no, just basically in, in response to Jason, I, I, I completely <laughs> recognize that, uh, that challenge. 
but I, I think we have seen um, how um, conflict and peace building perspectives are being brought into um, um, these kind of uh, business practices. Um, so, for instance, look at the, the Kipperly uh, certification process. Um, and I'm not saying that, that, it, that it's flawless, but um, what it does is that to a large extent it's preventing uh, so-called so conflict diamonds um, from entering the mainstream uh, rough uh, diamond markets. And, and basically, I, th I think this can be uh, uh, repl replicated. Um, I mean, the peace building community that, that I represent um, really needs to be part of, of, this, of this conversation on, on how climate change, um, climate mitigation and adaptation can, can help tackle the, basically the challenges ahead. And we can, we can build on, on, a, on a few good examples that are there and that are uh, to, to some good extent are, are working. Yeah, you know, I, I would say just to butt in really quickly, I mean, my hat's off to the great work from International Alert, because, I mean, we, we have looked at, you know, there was a framework that uh, International uh, Alert had sort of worked on about a year and a half or two years ago around sort of uh, uh, corporates dealing with human rights in conflict affected areas, you know, and this kind of work is is incredibly valuable, but but we're not seeing other ESG data providers, you know, or, or, or other even multilaterals, you know, kind of working on it. So, so hats off, you know, great work for International Alert. So Marie Walsh is watching right now. Hi, Marie. Thank you for this. I'd like to hear more from ICAO, please, about practical ways to shift the power from the big corporations and the West to the global majority. ICAO. I think one of the ways I don't have all the answers, but I think one of the ways, Marie, that we could think about is there's this book because Small is Beautiful. So it's really looking at those mechanisms that it doesn't have to be economic growth is not the big companies. Economic growth is around, you know, smaller cooperatives of communities that can contribute to the grid. It is finding ways that women, you know, can have a market solar system or a biogas system that contributes to the energy production. But this current focus of governments that looks at where the big money is coming from, from the international financial institutions to either do a big hydropower, to do a big solar that really in the end those and that energy production doesn't get to communities so it's looking at decentralized systems that can con, you know link to so you know in in africa we say in swahili we say kidogo kidogo hujaza kibaba so small small meets the bigger impact and so mm -hmm. with that thought in mind we've got to start to think about how and that way because it's small small and everybody's contributing you're not building this big act that leaves the small people out of it so that the small people are contributing they're not just victims they're not only you know recipients but they are really part of the production systems and i think that's the way we can start to think about it give us an example use yourself as an example on what you did around lake takana and the community there i think one of the things seeing how communities in lake takana were able to say that the energy production in Ethiopia is not effect, is not is not for them, and so the communities came together. We did not start this idea of friends of Lake Turkana, you know, just thinking about it. It's communities who said we've got to be able to have our voice in the energy conversations because the Gibe Three Dam was being built by international financial institutions, you know, the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the European Investment Bank, and it was that effort of communities saying, how do we make sure that we are able to, to be part of a discussion that says, you know, when you're talking about energy production, where are we in this energy production? And we can see the same even with electric and wind power, which is the largest on our land. So starting to see, you know, a lot of focus has been on corporate social responsibilities to the local communities. But we start to look at land as natural capital so that the people are not just recipients of the power, they are actually owners of the companies that are generating this you know, power, food production and that. So we've got to start rethinking this so that the economic, social um, development is, is really an, an environmental impacts are looked at from the lens of corporate frameworks, global frameworks, but also local realities. And I think that, that, that balance is what we need to start to work towards. I have a very pointed question from Tom. Tom, thank you for this question. It's for the panel, but we'll start with Jonathan. What is on the agenda at COP26 for climate, peace and security more specifically? A really great question, Tom, and for others. Um, 
so so I, I don't think people at COP will avoid will be able to avoid talking about climate, peace, stability, security. Um, as we've heard from all the panelists, like this is life. And you know, when you look at the the kind of the the, the risks that are on someone's plate, um, a vulnerable person's plate, you know, you you can't differentiate always between all the different pressures. Um, life is just hard, it's on the edge and it's vulnerable, and climate change is only going to exact debate that um, so so it is it will come up it is very important and um, as you can imagine cop itself is is largely focused on on negotiations and, and achieving negotiation outcomes obviously you know this 1.5 degree target is absolutely critical um, and then after that you know adaptation and and just to respond to a few of the things that Ikal is saying, which I, I love and, and are fantastic to hear. Um, you know, one of the things we're trying to do, particularly with one of the presidency theme days on adaptation, loss and damage is to ensure that as much as um, any kind of government is able to, is to sort of hand over the space to others to, um, you know, to use our, our space as a COP president to hand it over in our events on those days to, to really hear. So we've got events on kind of hearing from youth and the most vulnerable. We're, we're really keen to hear from communities at the front line, uh, at the kind of front line of climate change action. Um, mm -hmm. So it is really, really very important. But in terms of in terms of actual events, um, specifically with a focus on climate security, um, I'd encourage you to, to watch this space. Um, it's, um, it's something that um, lots of people want to discuss, but is also quite separate to the negotiations um, in a way. So there's a, there's a tricky balance in that. Um, and, you know, certainly from the UK and the COP presidency side, we're doing our best. Um, but I know that lots of others are interested and are planning events. Um, so do, do keep your eyes open for it and do engage in the debate. And uh, my, my encouragement to all of you who are taking part in COP or, or going to be there is, you know, raise the issues that are important. Um, I think we, we've got to embrace the complexity of this. I think there's a, there's a tendency to want to reduce it down to one, one issue at a time or one thing at a time. But actually, this is really complex um, and we need to tackle the whole um, at once. So I'd encourage you to, um, you know, if someone's oversimplifying something, um, challenge them on that. Um, and, and, and speak speak something different. All right, I, I'll take you on your word, Jonathan. Um, that was a very artful, skillful answer because Tom said specifically, and you said, watch this space and it will come up. Of course, Jessica, you are, you're laser focused on COP26. I'm sure you've gone through all of the agenda. What did you see? Well, I, I basically want to actually respond to, to, to what Jonathan is saying, because um, yes, what we're going to see in COP is just a lot of conversations around how are we going to um, reduce, uh, reach net zero, how are we going to help reduce adapt to climate change, and how are we going to secure funding for, for all of this. And um, the, the, that's great, that's going to happen, it has to happen. Um, but yeah, watch this space is, is, is in my view, not, not enough. And, and even if I appreciate the agenda for the for the COP is is congested and and we need to focus on on on, on kind of reaching those 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 pledges, um, but maybe there is an opportunity that after the, the, this COP in, in Glasgow we actually take a step back and, and organize uh, an event or something um, to to look at the achievements of, of this COP this year this year's COP and then look at it from okay so what does this actually mean for today's world looking at the climate and, and, and security risks that the, that the world is facing that are uh, uh, aligned with the green energy transition. And what's, what, what can the world do um, to, um, uh, yeah, to make sure that we're not gonna see, you know, spin-off conflicts from, from, from these well-intended uh, pledges. So actually that would be my, um, what I would really like to see if, if for instance, the UK government, but also other go uh, governments and, and, and uh, institutions are saying, okay, after this COP, let's have a very uh, dedicated conversation around, around this and, and what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Okay, hope. Jason, what's on your mind? Yeah, no, I was gonna say, I mean, there's specific things that I'm thinking, um, and I'll be at the COP26, but I'm, I'm sort of hoping, you know, my wish list, Article 6, which is about carbon markets, um, dealing with emig uh, emissions wedge issues. You know, this, this is incredibly important, this COP, because it brings, just in the, in the most general sense, 2030 into vision, you know, and sort of how we deal with 
electrification uh, or the decarbonization of electrification of, of certain industries. And so this is where we really kind of make things happen or with that kind of comes into view. I, I do struggle uh, kind of conceptualizing, you know, what that means from an emerging economy kind of, kind of you know, a perspective outside of um, how to fill a hundred billion of funding. Um, I do wonder, and I, I, you know, Jonathan, I'd be kind of curious your thoughts. You know, obviously the UK as president has some latitude in terms of managing the policy agenda, you know, in terms of sort of steering the, the uh, discussion and, you know, to, to what degree is, is uh, how, you know, what are the, is there a priority list? You know, is there a short list that you want to see accomplished coming out of COP26 um, in terms of outcomes, not just in terms of follow-up you know, points. Um, well, yeah, if I, if I can jump back in again. Um, so firstly, thanks Femi for saying, um, for my artful answer. And whilst that might be helpful for future job appraisal evidence, um, it's probably not helpful for the, for the listeners here and, and those on the panel. Um, okay. And um, I, think, I think you quite rightly touch on, the, on the, the, the difficulties and the responsibilities of being a neutral COP president. So, you know, the UK has its um, own kind of policy agendas and ambitions. In fact, you'll, you'll note that in February, um, the Prime Minister chaired a, a UNSC, the Security Council Open Debate on Climate Security. Um, Sir David Attenborough gave a passionate speech about it. And if you haven't seen that, you know, it's only three minutes long and it's, it's fantastic. Um, and, you know, so, so this is a critical issue. Um, the, the security implications of this are, are a critical issue for our time. In terms of COP itself, you know, we need to limit um, emissions so that we don't go above an average of 1.5 degrees. You know, in other parts of my job in the past, I've, I've worked on humanitarian responses. I've seen, you know, I've responded to Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas and saw, you know, many, many fatalities. Um, you know, those kinds of storms are going to happen more and more regularly. That's with 1.1 degrees we, uh, warming. You know, pastoralists in the Sahel, uh, I mean, where's the Sahel going to be in 10 years time? Where will we call Sub-Saharan Africa? Um, all these kind of big questions. So it is absolutely critical that we, we, we have that outcome of 1.5 degrees. It's absolutely critical that we see extra money um, and finance for adaptation, but not just extra money in terms of the big numbers. Um, but as Yikal says, like money that really flows down to those who are best placed to adapt um, and, and we stimulate that kind of, you know, everyone does this together type thing rather than always relying on states or multilaterals or some slightly slower moving beasts um, to, to do it. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask you panel for one more thought and it's going to come via Peter. Peter and I are going to combine what we'd like you to do. Um, Donovan has talked about climate change causing conflict. In fact, you all have. But what can peace builders do to help with climate change adaptation and mitigation? This brings us back to the promise. When you registered viewers, it said, well, how can you, if you're working in climate mitigation and adaptation, factor in the risk of conflict? Or I'm going to reverse that. If you're working in peace building, how can you factor in climate change, mitigation and adaptation. You each have 30 seconds to give our viewers a suggestion, either as a peace builder or somebody involved in climate mitigation and adaptation. What can they do? One suggestion from each of you. Jonathan. Um, invest in people. People have the capability to um see change and transformational change and if you empower people then they can do things that um, will surprise all of us so focus on people focus on power focus on empowerment and we'll see the change that that we want to see Ika. i'd say disrupting the systems because the systems are not are really not working for us so we've got to disrupt the systems to build new systems at the same time um, invest in women it's got you know we, we peace building does not happen in a vacuum and the you know adaptation is not happening in a vacuum. So investing in women so that the reproduction and production can be done in a gender sensitive and conflict sensitive way. Jason. Yeah, I was gonna say invest in communities and uh, impact strategies. Uh, we've seen tremendous growth in terms of, you know, sort of impact funds um, where, where the social and environmental impacts are, are sort of up even higher than the uh, returns. So I think we need to see more that, that, that sort of subordinate the, uh, the investment returns. 
and Jessica. Yeah, as, as peace builders, I think we really need to be out there. Um, we need to break through the silos, really actively seek cooperation with uh, climate change actors. Um, and, and we can basically um, actively work uh, with people working on climate action, adaptation, mitigation, and, and look for opportunities to build sustainable peace. Um, so basically to cooperate, seek joint solutions for basically more sustainable and peaceful future, future for all. Viewers, you've been amazing. I appreciate the uh, you co-hosting with me. That's been really exciting. I'm going to quote Agri Borussia, who says, thanks, panelists, for this great exposition. I couldn't have put it better myself. Thank you, webinar viewers. And I am just going to say that this webinar was brought to you by International Alert. Thanks for watching. <laughs>